A reading from the book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 32 through 34. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The word of God for the people of God. Gil Rendell tells the story of the two authors, Kurt Vonnegut and um, Joseph Heller. They were attending a party together that was hosted by a billionaire whose uh, extravagance was widely known throughout the land. And Vonnegut turned to Heller during the party and he said, Joe, how does it make you feel to know that our host made more money in the time that we have been at this party than all of the royalties that you ever got from Catch-22. And Heller responded, that may be so, but I have one thing our host will never have. I have enough. Enough. We all want it, don't we? We're all searching for it, whether we're intentionally searching, whether we acknowledge the search. We're all engaged in this effort to be content. Put on it whatever label you want to. It's, it's um, to be happy or comfortable or stable. We're searching for enough. For the next few weeks in worship, we are talking and we're thinking and praying about enough. Enough why we struggle to have that sense of contentment, and then the ways that God leads us toward it. Every year we take some time specifically to center our worship on on a theme that is close to generosity. We talk about what it means to live in a way that mirrors the generosity of God, just as we talked about with the children. Today I want to begin by simply acknowledging the struggle Generosity is hard, often first and foremost, because we struggle to believe that we have enough to be that generous. Michael Norton is a professor at Harvard uh, Business School, and he studies the connections between um, happiness and wealth. And he says that research regularly points to two central questions that people ask themselves when they are trying to determine whether they are satisfied. The first question is, am I doing better than I was before? And then the second question is, am I doing better than other people? These are questions that help us to determine whether we can or should be satisfied with what we have. Am I doing better than I was before, and am I doing better than others? So the goal, you know, this is relatable for all sorts of um, things, all sorts of issues. It's not just money, but when it comes to money, the goal then can only be more. That's the goal. The answer always has to be more. Am I doing better than before is really asking, do I have more than I did before? And am I doing better than other people is the same as asking, do I have more than other people? And we're selective, aren't we, about who those other people that we compare with are, aren't we? It's not, well, do I make more than entire countries of people in the third world? That doesn't feel that satisfying, does it? If we're honest. It's, instead, it's do I make more than the neighbors? Or more than the other families at the kids' school? Or more than the people that I, I want to be included with? Last year, Norton and his um, fellow researchers asked more than 2,000 people 
each of whom has a net worth of more than $1 million, at least $1 million net worth, and many of them had well above wealth worth more, well, well, well more than a million dollars. So they asked these 2,000 people how happy they were on a scale of one to 10. And then they asked them, how much more money would it take in order for you to answer 10 on that scale of happiness? How much more money would you need to make in order to say that you are perfectly happy? And the research came back and they said that no matter how far up on that income spectrum people were, they answered almost to a person that they would need two or three times as much income in order to be truly happy. That's a lot. Lynn Twist is a, a global activist and a fundraiser, and so her work, of course, doing fundraisers, it leads her to talk to both the extremely wealthy and the extremely poor. And she says that no matter where people fall on that spectrum, our conversations often revolve around what we don't have enough of, what we need more of. She says that w when we buy into the promise that more is better, that more equals better, then we can never arrive because there is always more. There is no end to more. People keep showing us, we think, well, that's about as wealthy as you could possibly get, and then somebody outdoes them. But even when you scale it down to regular size, take out the super wealthy, take out even the, the um, competitive aspect of it, the idea that more is the same thing as better that more must be better is pervasive in our lives, isn't it? When I go to Target and I see that they have little girls' shorts on sale for $4, then I figure I should go ahead and get my daughter some shorts because they're $4, right? It's a good deal and I don't know, she could probably use some more. That's what I say. She could probably use some more. And then I go home and I realize that I had temporarily forgotten about the two other times this spring that I had bought $4 shorts for her. Or the fact that she's already got 10 pairs of shorts handed down from her big sister. She didn't need more shorts. I didn't bother to stop and ask myself, does she, how many pairs of shorts does she have? She doesn't run out of shorts. She's not wearing dirty shorts. I mean, at least, hopefully not. She's not going to start wearing shorts suddenly at a more rapid rate than she did before. And if she did, I would get mad at her anyway, because then she's making more laundry for me. The fact is that I, I just got more because it seemed like a good idea to have more. More is better to have newer ones anyway, or to, to, to buy something on sale. That's a good idea, I got a screaming deal here. I only bought more really because there was more to be bought. Here's the thing, friends. Money itself is not the problem. Money is neutral. We need money, and, and money itself can be an expression of integrity just as much as it can be a source of stress in our lives. The cause of our struggle is actually that we are addicted to more. All throughout this country, at every income level, we are becoming addicted to acquiring more and more. In the last 45 years, the average American home has grown from 1,660 square feet to nearly 2,700 square feet. Even as the average number of people living in those homes has gone down. Because if there's more, if there's more square footage, then it must be a better house, right? All the while, we've been getting so much more stuff 
that we can't actually fit it in the houses, even though they're bigger houses, we still can't fit it. So now we have a booming industry for self-storage spaces. It's like the adult version of buying more shorts, isn't it? And the availability of credit has only made the problem worse. The normalization of debt, right? Since 1990, the average credit card debt has gone from $3,000 to nearly $17,000. And friends, that's an average. So for every one of us that pays it off every month, there's the other end of the spectrum. Friends, it's not a money problem. It's a heart problem. Jesus was not a financial coach, and yet he talked about money all the time. A third of his parables are about money. And he talked about money because he knew that money, that what we do with our money, is deeply tied to the state of our hearts. He knew that deciding whether we have enough is not at all about the bottom line in our bank accounts. There's no certain um, arbitrary monetary threshold that makes all of us suddenly, oh, I'm above this and I can relax, stop being anxious or afraid or competitive. Those feelings are more about the state of our souls. There's a reason why Our scripture reading this morning begins with Jesus saying, have no fear, little flock. He knows that where money is concerned, the the emotion that grips us first, when, especially when the preacher starts talking about money, it's not joy or gratitude, it's fear. Have no fear. Fear of danger, fear of loss, fear of hunger of some kind, or fear of of uncertain times. And somehow we get it in our head that the way to ease that fear, to settle that anxiety down in us is to have more, to protect ourselves, keep striving for more and to hope that one day we will finally feel like it's enough. Friends, it's not a financial question. It's a spiritual question. What is enough? What will be enough? And how do we get it? How do we live every day in that sense of sufficiency or even of abundance? Well, according to Jesus, our hearts have to change, not our bank accounts. It reminds me of the story in which Jesus asks the man who's been laying paralyzed on the ground for years, he asks him, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Do you want, do you want it to be different than this? Do you want to actually find enough? Then our desires have to change. Our sense of purpose has to change. And that involves practical things, changing habits, simplifying simplifying our lives, exercising restraint where we haven't before. But at the root of it, our hearts have to find their way away from fear and anxiety and into freedom. And when it comes to that, friends, we are in luck because that is the journey that God specializes in. That is the journey that actually only God can take us on. It involves waking up and asking, God, show me what is really important today. Help me to see what will last in my life and what will fade. Help me to see the difference today as I walk through my regular walking around life. It involves paying attention to the treasures that that you haven't been seeking. Stopping and, and slowing down and noticing, not being so busy on this quest for more, but instead slowing down to notice what is it that my heart actually is really longing for that I'm feeding with something else. 
Friends, these aren't just the first steps into that freedom. These are the daily steps into freedom. We keep taking them all our lives long. It's not just a one-time journey. That's why we come back to this series every single year, don't we? Because somehow we've gotten back in that place again, haven't we? We all know it so well. But here's the good news, friends. It's a journey that we don't take alone. We keep taking those steps, asking God those questions, and God has promised to guide us, to walk with us, every step along the way, along the way to freedom, along the way to enough. Thanks be to God. Amen.